Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Panchayat. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing a full three player game today. Now, before I go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and get access to a ton of exclusive content, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. Some of those exclusives include my hundreds of opinions segments, where I discuss all of the games that I'm playing recently, both the things I like and don't like about them, including returning to games that I play and giving updated opinions about them. You can also watch some of my videos early and advertisement free and get access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs that I make, including those opinions episodes that I just talked about. Now, coming back to this game, I do want to ask that if while you're watching this, some part of the game jumps out to you as particularly interesting, or if maybe you see me accidentally cheat, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Now, it is set in olden times India, and in these situations, there was a group of five village elders called the Panch, and they governed villages in India. This gave rise to the word Panchayat, meaning the rule of five. Now, in this game, each player is a leader of the Panchayat, and we're taking command to turn our barren pieces of land into thriving villages. The way we do this is in player order. We're going to be taking two tiles on each of our turns and placing them down into our grid. The tiles that we place can go onto any open spot or onto any of these bonuses that we placed during setup, and when we place on top of those, we score their condition. There are a variety of tiles in the game, and they have specific conditions that we are trying to meet in order to gain extra points. For example, this house is worth two points if it's next to the river, and it's also worth one point for each school it's orthogonally adjacent to. After taking two tiles, there will be some remaining, which will go down into stacks, and then the next player will go, and we're going to go in clockwise order around the table until everyone has taken eight turns. At that point, each of our villages will be completely full, and we will score for all of the tiles that we have in front of us, and then the player who has the most points will be the winner. Now, I will explain how all of this works in detail while we are playing, and on that note, we can start the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to play as the white player here, and we are also the starting player. So let's begin the first turn of the game. Now, the initial thing that we do at the start of every single player turn is we put out three new tiles from this stack. We can randomly take them. This is effectively one stack right here. And these tiles are the new buildings. Now, after we do this, it's time for us to take exactly two tiles from these markets. And once again, the top tiles are new buildings and the bottom tiles are old buildings. Now, when we go to take tiles, we can take any of the new buildings and we can take the topmost old buildings. On this first turn, all of the old buildings are the topmost, but as the game goes on, we're going to start to stack these tiles up, and you can, again, only take the top tiles from the old building stacks. So, these are our options. Out of these options, I think I'd like to start by placing this house. It has to be placed into our village, and specifically onto a spot that does not already have a tile, but these are bonus tiles. We can cover these up, and when we do, we'll activate their scoring condition. This one right here says we get two points when we build here, as long as we construct a commercial-type building. However, that is not the icon we have over here. This is residential, so we don't want to do this. If we did, we would get rid of this tile, but not get those two victory points. When we cover this one up, it is going to give us one point for every building that's near the river. Now, the word near means orthogonally adjacent, and at the top of all of our village boards, we have a river. Down the right side, we also have a farm, and for the tile that we are placing right here, this house says we immediately get two points if it's next to the river, and we also get one point for every near school. Now, we don't have any schools just yet, but we do have the river, and I think we want to place this over here. Now, that is next to the river, so that's going to get us two points. It's not near any schools, so no points for that. And we also get the points listed in the top left corner. So that's one plus two, or three points that we get for placing that house. We start with zero points, so now we have three. Now we have to take another building, and let's go for the medical clinic. This is a general type of building, and it gives us three points immediately when playing it, and it gets us one point for every near house. Well, we have a house right here, so I think we'll put this there. That way it's adjacent to the house, so we get three plus one or four points with this placement. I don't think I want to put this here because that is going to take up one of the spots next to the river, and I'd rather place a tile there that wants to be next to the river to give us those extra points. There are tiles that want to be in the middle. 
You'll notice these are green, and that is the village center, and those tiles will mention the village center down at their bottom. Now we haven't seen any of those tiles just yet, and I'm okay covering one of these village center locations. So again, we'll get three plus one or four points. This brings us up to seven. Now before we move on, I do want to point out that when you place new tiles down in the future, previously placed tiles will activate. For example, if we put this house down in the future, it would trigger the medical clinics plus one point for being near a house. As another example, if we put a school here in the future after placing these, then we could see that this house would get plus one point for us, and that house would get plus one point. So by placing this school here, we get one plus one plus one or three points. All right, we finished our two mandatory tile placements, and now we can finish our turn by moving all of the remaining new buildings down into the old buildings area. When you do this, there must always be exactly three rows of old buildings, and because there is a gap here, that means one of these two tiles will have to go into that gap, but then the other tile can be stacked on top of another stack of old building tiles. There could be multiple tiles on these stacks, but I do want to point out that if you ever have a situation where a fourth tile will be placed onto the stack, in that case, the three tiles that were there already get put into the discard pile, and then that fourth tile gets placed over here. Obviously, that's not going to be the case right here, because we have to put one of these two there. After thinking it through, I think we're going to put the wood workshop here, because again, one of these must go into that middle spot, and the restaurant can stack on top of the cow shed. Now, I do want to point out that when you stack these, you have to make sure that the name is uncovered, but you can cover up the bottom part, and that's because each player has a player aid that details the specifics of every tile in the game, including the number of those tiles that are within the overall stacks. So we can easily see what a cow shed does by looking over here on our player aid. Well, our turn is done, so that means play moves clockwise over here to the green player. They, of course, start their turn by drawing three new buildings from the stacks. Once again, they have to take two tiles, and I do want to point out that if they took a tile from a stack, then that would uncover another tile which they could take later on this turn. They've decided not to take the restaurant though, instead they'll go with the wood workshop. And that is going to get them one point if it's next to a farm. Now every village has a farm going down the right side of it, so we have four spots that can be in the farm, and technically this spot is next to the farm and the river. They've decided to place the wood workshop down here. That's worth three points, and it's next to the farm, so that's one more point, getting them four. So they go to four points total. And then for their second tile, they're going to take the post office. This is the utility type of tile, and it will lose you one point if you place it next to the river. In addition to that, the post office has an ongoing effect for the rest of the game. That says that the green player can now pick the topmost tile when they are taking tiles on their turn. Now, they don't want to place this next to the river, so they're going to put it way down here in the corner, and it will get them two points, which will bring them up to six. Now, again, that post office lets them take a tile from the top of the discard pile, but we don't currently have one of those. That will be created once we have our first stack of three tiles be covered up by a fourth tile, which puts those three tiles into the discard. After that, Green has to bring all three of these new buildings down. They've decided to put the flour mill there, the well there, and they'll stack this tea stall on top of the restaurant. Well, Green is done, which means the brown player can go, and they'll start by drawing three new buildings to place on the board. After considering their options, they've decided to start by taking this cow shed. They're going to place that over here, and as you can see, this is worth one point right now, but at the end of the game, the player who has the most or tied for the most cow sheds is going to gain 10 extra victory points. So they're going to put this here and take one point, which means they have one total. And then their second tile will be the statue. This is worth three points, and it's worth another point if it's in the village center. Remember, the village center are the green spots in the middle, and they're going to put this right here, so that's three plus one, or four more points for them. Four points brings them up to five. And then they finish their turn by placing this one remaining new building on top of an old building stack. They've decided to go here, actually. That is the fourth tile, which means the previous three tiles are going to be discarded. And we can start that discard pile right over here. Their turn is done, which means we now get to take our second turn of the game so we can reveal three new buildings. I think the first tile we should take is this wood workshop. There's a couple reasons for that. The first is that we can place it right over here, which is next to a farm, and get three plus one or four points, which certainly seems good. That will bring us from seven up to 11. But then the next reason this is good for us has to do with these end game victory point tiles up here. At the start of the game, we randomly draw four of these from a much larger stack. And at the end of the game, we're gonna count up the number of these individual buildings, and the player who has the most of those pairs will get five points. 
You must have at least one of each of those in order to vie for it. And two of these show houses, whereas this one right here shows a wood workshop, which is what we just took. Now, specifically to vie for this, each player will count the number of pottery and wood workshops they have. They have to have at least one of each of those. And then the player or players, if tied, who have the most will get five points. So by having a house and a wood workshop, we're starting to work towards a lot of these. And I noticed this one it says house plus temple. There is a temple out here that we can place, so let's go for it. This says that we'll get three points immediately, and then we'll gain another point if it's in the village center, and we will lose a point if it is next to industry. Now, industry buildings have this icon, and they have red borders on the top and bottom, so we certainly don't want to place this next to that, and we want to put it in the middle anyway. So I think we'll just put this here, that is in the village center, so we get three plus one, or four points. We had 11, so this brings us up to 15. And now our turn is done. So we have to take all of the remaining new buildings and put them down. There is a school here and a school there. I suppose we could just stack those up. Although these schools aren't great right now, they're worth one point plus two points for each adjacent pandit house. But we haven't seen a single pandit house yet. So if we place this on top of something that we think our opponents might want, maybe that will hinder them. Sure, we'll put this on top of the well. That well says you get two points for each adjacent house and minus one point for being adjacent to the river. We do have a house, so I contemplated this, but the well doesn't help us for any of the end game victory points. And in order to place next to the house, we'd have to go next to the river. So maybe we should have done some of our placements differently, but we'll have to deal with the decisions we've made. And yeah, we'll put this here for now. This flour mill isn't particularly interesting at the moment either. It's two points plus two points for each granary it's near. Now we might see some granaries immediately, or it might be a little while. Either way, that has finished our turn. So now the green player can go. They start by bringing out three new buildings. Aha, a granary. Okay, well, I guess we should have blocked that. Yeah, green is going to start by taking this granary. And that is going to get them three points plus one if it's adjacent to a farm. They have three more spots that want to be adjacent to farms. So they're going to put this right over here. That gets them three plus one or four points. They were at six, so now they go to ten. And for their second tile, they'll take the flour mill. That is worth two points, plus two points for each granary it's near. They're going to put it right here, and who knows, maybe they'll find another flour mill to get points from that granary. If they put a flour mill here, of course, they are denying potential points for a farm placement later. But either way, for now, they get four points for that placement. That brings green from 10 up to 14. Now, of course, the green player could have taken from the top of the discard pile because of their post office, but they decided not to. Now, with their turn ending, they have to put these tiles down. They could, of course, make another stack run over to make the discard pile bigger, but they don't think that's necessary in this moment. They've decided what they're going to do is place this workshop here, and then they'll put a flower stall on top of it. Okay, green is done, which means the brown player can go. They start by bringing out three new buildings. Ooh, a house. They've decided to take the house, and that gives one point, plus two if it's next to the river, plus one for each school it's next to. They don't have a school right now, and they're going to put the house over here. That will get them two points for the river and one for the tile. So they go up to eight. After that, they are going to take this well. That gives one point, plus two points for each house it's adjacent to, and it loses one point if it's next to the river. They're going to put this right here so that it's next to that house. And then they'll get one plus two or three more points. That brings them from eight up to 11. They're lagging behind a little bit, but they're not feeling too bad right now. They do have a cow shed. <laughs> so now Brown has to put this pottery shed down and they're going to cover up this flower stall. The reason for that is because the flower stall gives two points for each temple it's near and they can tell we have a temple. So if we want to place that flower stall, they want to make it a little bit harder by putting the pottery on top. Although honestly, we probably want that pottery anyway. Either way, they've decided to put it there and that means their turn is done, which means we now get to go. So we can begin by bringing out three new buildings. Oh, a restaurant. This is the first time we've seen that. It's two points, and it gives an extra point for each statue it's near. So we now have to take two tiles, and I think we're going to start with this pottery. Now, a big reason for that is because this end game tile here wants us to have pottery and workshops, and the person with the most is going to get five points, and we already have a workshop. Remember, we have to have at least one of each of these. So by taking that pottery, we are now vying for that goal. The pottery will get us one point if it's placed next to a river. So yeah, let's put it here. That is going to get us three plus one for the river. That gets us four total, bringing us to 19. 
And then I guess we could take this pottery here. That helps us compete even more for that end game goal. And we do have a slot next to the river. Yeah, let's go for it. Now, if we put this here, that would cover up our adjacency bonus. That would immediately get us one point for every building we have near the river. The thing is, we have three buildings near the river, and I'd much rather put this here and then put a fourth building next to the river on top of that as we score it. So we're going to leave that open for now and place the pottery here. That will get us three plus one or four points again. That will bring us up to 23, and now our turn is done. Now we have these tiles to put out. And I think we should be a little bit offensive. If we put the temple here and then the restaurant on top of that, it will discard all of these. Now, it's true the green player can go to the discard pile, but inside here, there is a flower stall, a temple, and a workshop. And all of these vie for various endgame goals in this specific play. So we'll remove them from the general market, putting them on top of the discard pile. Again, green could get access to these, but I still think it's a good idea to try and hide these a little bit to stop our opponents from fighting us with those majorities. So that finished our turn. That means green gets to go. Oh, and another cow shed came out. Remember, having the most or tied for the most of these at the end of the game gets you 10 points, which is a significant amount. We can also see a whole bunch of schools. Remember, these give two points for each nearby pandit house. We haven't actually seen any of those yet, so they're still in the stacks. Green has decided they're going to take the cow shed. This has no adjacency bonuses on it, and they're just going to put it here. Uh, they do get one point for playing it, which brings them to 15. For their next tile, Green is going to use their post office, which lets them take the top tile from the discard pile, and they're going to take this temple. That will get them three points plus one if it's in the village center, and it will lose them one point for each industry it's next to. So they're going to put it here. That is in the village center, so that's three plus one or four points, which brings them up to 19. Now they can finish their turn by putting these new buildings down, and they're going to do this. <laughs> There's only schools at the top of these stacks, and the school is pretty good as soon as we found a pandit house. So it's time for Brown to go, and they start by taking tiles from the top. There is a regular house, a cow shed, and another house. Okay. Now this is a tricky decision for Brown. They could take both of these houses, denying it from their opponents. That's pretty powerful considering two of these end game bonuses do require houses, but then there is this cow shed. Brown has one and green has one, so that would put Brown back in the lead. But again, these cow sheds are pretty bad for points you get immediately, so you really gotta make sure you get that majority if you invest in them. Then again, they could take these two houses and hope that we take the cow shed, forcing a tie, instead of letting this go to the green player. Yeah, I think that's what they decide to do. Each of these houses is worth one point, plus two points if it's next to the river, and one point if it's next to a school. They have not taken a school just yet, and they're just going to put the houses here along the river, so that's going to be three points, plus three points, or six points total. That will bring Brown up to 17, and they can finish their turn by placing this cow shed down. I think they'll put it here. All right, it's our turn, so we can bring out three new buildings. And we have a tea stall, another cow shed, interesting, and a railway station. All right, so the railway station is the other utility. It gives three points when you place it, and you lose one point for each nearby temple. And once per game, you can move a building. You take that building from somewhere on your board, and you move it to an empty spot. You don't rescore it or anything, but you do get that flexibility. When you use the railway station, you rotate it to show that it's used its once per game effect. Now, before we actually take any tiles, I think it's time to talk about another element of final scoring. So far, we've discussed cow sheds as well as these endgame tiles. And in addition to those, there is one more way we get points at the end of the game, and that involves our largest groupings of specific types of buildings. Now, by that, I am talking about the commercial, residential, industrial, and utility buildings, not the yellow general buildings. Now, the way this scoring works is at the end of the game, you find your largest contiguous group of each of those color types, and then you get two points for each building in that group. So if the game ended right now, our largest residential is size one, so that would get us two points, and our largest industrial is size two, though we do have a size one down here. So if this was adjacent, that would be worth six points, but for now, it's only worth four. So we do have to keep in mind the color adjacencies for these large groups when we are placing tiles down. Again, we don't score this for the yellow buildings, so those don't necessarily need to be adjacent. This means it would be great to put a green tile here, which is why we are pretty bummed that the brown player took both of those houses. The house is green, so we could have put it there, scored four points, and then continued our residential group. But of course, brown saw that and decided to deny it from us. 
Now, we could take a school that is residential and we could put it there. We won't get any river bonuses, but it is green, so it would expand that group even more, effectively getting us another two points. That being said, we still have a decent amount of space, and we have other options available to us. In particular, two cow sheds is quite compelling. Remember, having the most gets us 10 points. And there is also this tea stall. That's worth one point plus three for every adjacent cow shed. So we could set things up by taking both of these cow sheds to leave a position that's next to both of those on the off chance we have the ability to take a tea stall. If anything, we'd be forcing our opponents to take the tea stall away from us instead of maybe working towards some other goal. Yeah. I think let's go for it. Let's take both of these cow sheds. Let's put them like this. That way we could put a T-stall there, hypothetically at some point, and score for six extra points. Hopefully we can actually get access to one of those. There are only three in the entire game, and we've seen two of them already. One is in the discard, and one of them is currently in the market. Now, of course, we score for these. That's one and one, so two points total. That brings us to 25, and we are now in the lead with the cow shed majority. Now, with our turn ending, we have to place these down and I think I'm okay putting in the T stall here. That will be the fourth in that stack. So these will go to the discard pile. And then this railway station can go, hmm, we could go there to try and stop our opponents from taking this. Although, of course, they could stack on top of that and make it go away, removing it as an option entirely. I think we probably shouldn't do that. Let's put this on top of the school instead. All right, our turn is done. This means green now gets to go, and they, of course, start by bringing out three new buildings. We see a statue, a flour mill, and a quarry. Oh, this is the first time we've seen that one. It's worth three points, and you lose two points if it's adjacent to the farm. Their first tile seems like a pretty great idea. They're going to go for the flour mill. That can go here, and it's worth two points, plus two more for each granary it's near, and there's a granary right there. Of course, that's next to the farm, and they don't get a specific bonus there, but they've also increased the size of their commercial group by one for an extra two points at the end of the game. Of course, by placing this, they get two plus two because of that single nearby granary. This means green gets four points, bringing them to 23. After this, they've decided to take this quarry. Once again, this is three points, and it loses two points if it's next to the farm. So they're not going to put it there, and they actually like this idea, because that's going to expand their industrial group by one, so that's going to get them two more points at the end of the game, and they're hoping to put a industrial tile here as well until the game is over. Now, the game does end after everyone has taken eight turns. Our villages have 16 spaces in it, and obviously we take two tiles each turn, so after those eight turns, every single spot in our village will be full as we go into final scoring. Now, either way, I'm getting ahead of myself. This quarry will get them three points right now, which puts them in the lead up to 26. All right, they can finish their turn by placing this statue, and they do want to cover up the T-stall. Green is done, so brown can go, and they'll start by bringing out some new buildings. There is a temple, a medical clinic. Oh, it's been a bit since we've seen one of these. It's worth three points, and it's an additional point for each nearby house. The last new building is a flower stall, which gives two points for each nearby temple. Out of these options, Brown has decided to start with a railway station. This will get them three points, and they'll lose one point for each nearby temple. They don't have any temples just yet, though. And they're going to put the railway station here. So that gets them three points, which brings them up to 20. Now they're going to use this railway station. And remember, this says once per game, you can tilt it sideways to move one building to another open spot, and you don't gain or lose victory points as you move it. In this case, they've decided to move this house there. And the reason they're doing that is because they're going to take this medical clinic for their second tile and place it here. Remember, this is three points plus one for each nearby house. And now they have two nearby houses. So that's three plus one plus one, or five points for placing that tile. They had 20, so this brings them up to 25. All right, it's time for them to place these tiles down. And yeah, they don't want us to get access to this tea stall. They definitely want to put something on top of that. And they're going to go with the flower stall. Now, if they wanted, they could put the temple there as well so that all these go away. But they figure this tea stall is three down, which means we can't get access to it. So they don't necessarily need to do that. Yeah, and instead, they're going to put this temple here. All right, their turn is done, which means it's time for us to go again. And I do want to point out that at this point, every player has eight tiles, so we've all taken four turns. Each of our villages is half full, and we, of course, keep playing until our villages are full. So let's go for it. We, of course, begin by bringing out some new buildings. Here is another medical clinic. 
Next up, we have a railway station and then a granary. Wow, we have still not seen any of those pandit houses. There are only four of them and quite a few tiles left over. We shuffle all of these at the start of each game. And I think let's just start with this granary. This is our first commercial building, so by definition, it's going to create the largest commercial building group, so it's effectively worth two more points to us. And we have this placement bonus, which is going to get us two points immediately if we place a commercial building on top of it. I think let's go for it. Now, I do want to mention that during setup, we got these tiles randomly, but then we got to decide where to put them. And I decided to put this here next to the farm, hoping to get a tile like this one that wants to be next to the farm. So this granary is going to get us three points plus one if it's next to the farm. It is, so that is four points. And we covered this placement bonus up with a commercial building. So that's two more points. This means we get six points total for that placement. That will bring us from 25 up to 31. Next up, I think what we should do is take this school. This might not seem great because, again, we don't have any pandit houses, so this is only going to get us one point, but I want to put it here. Now, again, none of these interact with it, and we'll just get one point for now, but I am hoping we can get another house to go right here. If we do, those houses score a plus one point for each adjacent school, and obviously that spot is next to the river for extra points. Now, we might not get access to another house, but either way, I want to put another green here of some type, and I do hope to be able to find another one. That way, we could have a size three residential area to get two points each for those. Of course, we could put the school here right now and score that adjacency tile, but I'd rather go here and hope that in the future, we can get a house to really make this spot pay off for us. There are seven house tiles total in the game, and so far we've seen four of them, so there are three more to come. Now, of course, that school did get us a single point, so we go to 32, and that will finish our turn. Now we can put these two down, and the railway station is pretty powerful, letting you move your tiles around. I think what we'll do is put it here, and then we'll put the medical clinic on top of it so that these go away. Although, again, <laughs> the green player does have that post office so they could get access to this, but the brown player can't get access to it, and I think that's just fine. So, yeah, we'll move those away. The green player has no houses, so they can't really make use of this medical clinic, and our turn is done. This means green gets to go, and they can start by bringing out new buildings. There is a granary, a quarry, and a house. Oh, that's one of the three remaining. They are certainly going to take this house, and then they'll put it here. Now, one of the reasons they're doing this is because their adjacency bonus gets them points for houses, and they just have not been able to get any. So that is going to help them out. Now, they, of course, could put this here. This gets them two points if they put a residential building on top of it, but they want to get the bonus for going next to the river. Again, the house scores one point, plus two for being next to the river, and plus one for each nearby school, and they don't have any schools just now. So they'll get three points for this placement. And I suppose that did start their first residential area, so that will probably be worth a couple more points to them at the end of the game. For now, three points brings them up to 29. And then they're going to take this granary. They're going to put that here. This gives them three points plus one if it's adjacent to the farm, and it is. And that grew their commercial area by yet another tile. So even more endgame points for them. Now, in this moment, they gain three plus one or four points, which brings them from 29 up to 33. All right, they've taken their tiles, so now they have to put this quarry down, and they're going to cover the well. All right, green is done, which means brown now gets to go. They start by revealing tiles. There is a statue, a well, and a house. Oh gosh, there's only one more house left in here. Of course, it's possible brown might not take this. We'll just have to see what they do right now on their turn. After considering it, yeah, they are going to take the house. Not only can they see that this would be a great move for us, it's also pretty darn good for them. They can go right here, which is going to combine these into a size 4 group of residential tiles. So by putting this here, they effectively gained 4 more points at the end of the game. And of course right now, they get 1 plus 2 for being next to the river, and it's not adjacent to a school. So they'll get 3 points immediately. Those three points bring them to 28. And remember, two of these endgame tiles want majorities with houses. So that's helping the brown player vie for both of them. Now, of course, they need at least one temple to try and get this one. And they need at least one flower stall to try and get that one. And at the moment, they don't have either of those. Ooh, they're thinking maybe they should take this flower stall, even though they don't have the temple. Ooh, they're really wishing they'd grabbed a temple now. Yeah, they're going to do it, though. This is their first commercial tile, and it gives plus two points for each nearby temple. Again, they don't have any temples. Now, they could put this over here next to the farm, 
If they place down here, they'll get one point for every building near the farm, but somehow they have built nothing next to the farm just yet. I think they will go here. They could go there, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, they'll go here. If they could put another utility here, that would get them some more points for that larger group at the end of the game. So this flower stall just gets them one point, but importantly, that helps them vie for those five points at the end of the game. That particular tile, they have one, two, three, four, five buildings total, which certainly puts them in the lead for it. For now, though, they just get one point. All right, they are done, which means they can place these down, and they can tell that we could get access to this tea stall now, and they want to make sure that does not happen. So they've decided to put a hmm statue here and then well on top of it to get rid of all of these tiles to deny that option from us. We are pretty bummed to see that, and now it's our turn. Now there is a single house left in here, although there are four of the bandit houses, which we haven't seen just yet, and it seems very likely that we will see one soon. So let's see what our three options are. A post office, a school, that is green, and a pandit house. We finally saw one. Now this is worth one point immediately, and it also gives two points for each adjacent temple. In addition to that, it is green. It is residential, which is important. Now we do have a temple. Unfortunately, it is not adjacent to where we would potentially put that pandit house. One thing I suppose we could do though, is place the pandit house here to get three points, two of which for being next to the temple, and then the school could go there, for example, uh, and that would get us two points for being next to the pandit house. Maybe in the future, we could pick up a railway station to move these residences around so that they're next to each other, but I'm not entirely sure that'll happen. This would, of course, start another group of these residences, which means it would potentially conflict with the plan we have over here. Or, of course, we could just take one of these and put it over there in order to connect those tiles up. You know what? We still have a couple turns, so we might be able to get a better residence for that spot on our next turn. Hopefully, we'll draw an actual house to use. I think instead... Let's take the quarry. We can place that up here, which is going to expand out our industrial area. Unfortunately, these are split up. It would have been a lot better if that workshop was over there, but it is not. We, of course, don't want to put the quarry next to the farm because it would get us three points and immediately lose us two points for the farm. I think this is probably a good idea overall, though. So we'll gain three points, bringing us to 35. And then we can place one of these and I figured we'll just go with the medical clinic. That is worth three points plus one for each adjacent house. We could put this here, but that would break up a potential group of the residentials that we're trying to go for. So I think we'll just put it down here instead. It appears this is going to be our industrial area, not that one down there. So that will just get us three points for the placement. This will bring us up to 38. And it looks like we didn't take any of the new buildings. So we can send those down. I think let's put the pandit house here and the school on top of it to stop somebody from playing the pandit house and then the school after that to get those points. We can also put this post office down and we'll put it here. All right, we are done. That means green can go and we'll see some more tiles. This is a tea stall. <laughs> I really wish we'd seen that on our turn. A flour mill and a quarry. They really like the look of these tiles. They're going to start with the quarry and they can place that right here where it will get them three points and they do not lose two points for being next to the farm because they're not next to the farm. That also increased the size of their industrial group. So they'll get three points, which brings them to 36, and then they'll take this flour mill. So far, the green player has done a very good job of making large groups. They're going to put this flour mill there, where it's going to be worth two points, plus two more for each nearby granary, and there is a granary. They've got flour mill, granary, flour mill, granary, flour mill so far. Now, that means they'll get four points for this, and they just increased the size of their commercial by yet another tile. That's great for endgame scoring, but for the moment, it'll get them four points, which is also great. Four points brings them up to 40, and they can end their turn by putting this tea stall down. They want to make sure that we don't have access to this, so they've decided they're going to put it here, and they're going to hope that the brown player either takes it or forces this to go into the discard pile. Speaking of brown, it's now time for them to go, so they can start by bringing out three new buildings. There is a railway station, a cowshed, and pottery. They've decided to start with pottery, and they'll place that here. As you can see, this is an industrial building, and this is their placement bonus, which gets them two points if they put an industrial building there. So they'll get two points, plus three points for pottery, plus another point because this is adjacent to the river. So that is going to be six points total. This will bring them from 29 up to 35, and then they will take another cow shed. 
This is going to be their second cow shed, which means they are going to tie us for that majority to get 10 points at the end of the game. They, of course, have to place this down somewhere, and they've decided they're going to go here. So that's going to get them one point immediately. This brings them to 36, and now they can finish their turn, and they are indeed going to place the railway station there. That forces all of these away, and I really wish we had a post office. There is one right there. Maybe we should have taken one earlier, because that tea stall that would be worth seven points to us is now just out of reach at the top of the discard pile. All right, it's time for three new buildings, and we really want to see a tea stall or a house. That is pottery, restaurant, and... Mmm, Pandit House. That is not the house we were looking for. You know what? I think let's start by taking this railway station, and we can put it here. That will get us three points immediately, and we lose one point for each nearby temple. This temple is close, but not technically nearby. So, that's three points, which brings us up to 41. And now that's going to give us the option to move a tile, so we can move this wood workshop up there, joining it with the rest of our industry. We don't have to do that right now, though. But we do have to take one of these. Now, this restaurant is on one of those endgame goals. It's paired up with the tea stall. Although at this point, I'm not really sure we're going to get access to a tea stall before the game is over. This is our third to last tile that we're taking for the entire game. And I'm wondering if now is the time that we should just take one of these residential tiles in order to make that group bigger. It's possible there won't be any residential tiles available to us at the start of our next turn. We just can't be sure, and our opponents would certainly try to make that not be the case if they had control over it. That being said, we could be greedy and take this restaurant or this pottery. Pottery could go here or here, and then we could use the railway station to move the wood workshop over to make a size 5 industrial. And the restaurant could go here, which would increase our commercial, and this is worth plus one point for each near statue, although we don't actually have any statues. So I suppose by doing this, we'd get two plus two or four points for that placement, whereas if we took the pottery, well, that's three points plus two more or five points total, assuming we connect this up with a larger industrial group. You know what? Five points is bigger than four, and one of these endgame things wants us to have pottery and wood workshops, and we have at least one wood workshop. So yeah, I think we're going to take the pottery and risk it and hope that there's any type of green residential tile to place over here on our next turn, which will be our final turn. For the moment, I think we'll put the pottery here. That leaves this spot open for potentially the wood workshop or potentially a tile that scores better for being in the center of our village. We'll just have to see what our options are. In the moment, though, we get three points and we do not gain the extra point because that requires this to be near the river. So three points will bring us up to 44. Now we can end our turn by putting these things down, and we certainly don't want to stack a green at all. We want to increase the odds that there is at least one green tile on our next turn. So we'll put that there and we'll put the restaurant there and our turn is done. This means green can go, so they're going to bring out more tiles. And there is even more pandit houses. It's not too surprising we're seeing so many of them suddenly, considering most of the game went by before we saw the first one. Maybe it was a good risk for us to not take a green. There's quite a bit of them out here right now. Out of these options, they've decided to take a pandit house, and they'll place it here. That's going to be worth one point, plus two points for each nearby temple, and there is a single nearby temple. So that's going to be 2 plus 1, or 3 points for them. That brings them up to 43. And then they'll take this school, and they'll put it here. That's worth 1 point, plus 2 points for each nearby pandit house. There is one of those, so that's 3 points total. And maybe more importantly, by putting this here, they've gone from a 2-point residential group being their biggest to a 6-pointer. So that's essentially 4 more points at the end of the game. For the moment, though, they take 3 points, which brings them up to 46 and then they can end their turn by bringing these tiles down. They've decided they do want to make it as likely as possible that there aren't any green available, so they'll put those like that, and they're hoping the brown player will make these go away and maybe take this? We'll just have to see what brown does. Well, speaking of which, it is now their turn, so they can reveal three new buildings. Ooh, no residentials. Brown now gets to go, and they've decided to take this workshop, and they're going to place it here. That's worth three points plus one if it's next to a farm, and it is, so four points total, and it expanded their industrial group by one. Four points will bring them from 36 up to 40, and now Brown has a very important decision. They could take this pandit house, which is not good for them. It would just give them a single point, but 
By removing this, it increases the possibility that we won't have any green tiles available to us on our last turn. They could, of course, make this go away, and if we reveal no green tiles, then we're going to lose a bunch of points. But by doing this, they're only getting one point. That forfeits quite a few points for them overall. I suppose it would technically be worth three points because they could go here and expand the residential area. But instead of that, they could put this restaurant here, which would expand that, essentially giving them the same bonus points. Plus, it always gives two points and another point for each nearby statue. So effectively, by placing this here, they would get five points, whereas the Pandit House would only give them three. So they would get two additional points, but they would guarantee that we have the option of placing a residential tile here. Now, I think if they could guarantee that there would be no residential tiles pulled on our next turn, they might go for it. But they don't want to sacrifice precious points on the chance that we might still not end up being blocked. Yeah, they're going to go for the restaurant. That means they are going to get two plus one for this nearby statue or three points immediately. That will bring them up to 43. And now they can end their turn by placing these out. They could use one of these to make that go away and put the other one on top of the pandit house to make us have to work for it to get access to this. The problem for the brown player right now is that we would not mind having a quarry or a granary. Technically, the quarry is probably worth slightly less points than the granary, so they're going to put this here and the granary will go there. That will clear all of these out. And now it's time for our final turn of the game. Now, as you can see, there's only two tiles left over here, so we can flip that. Ha-ha, <laughs> it's a house! Perfect! Uh, and then this is the temple. Actually, we were kind of keeping track, and we knew there was one more house, and we hadn't seen it yet. So I suppose we were not sweating in that moment when Brown was doing the math. They could have known there was still a house here, I suppose, but they did not. Now, as you can see, we do need one more tile, and in this case, we take the entire discard pile. We then shuffle it up and make a new draw stack and bring out the next tile. So it's possible we might see something that was good and buried. It would be amazing to pull a T stall off of the top. Let's see it. Nope, it's a railway station. Dang. Well, this is still an excellent turn for us. We're going to take this house and place it here. As you can see, that's going to get us one point for every building near the river for our adjacency bonus. We have four buildings next to the river, so that's four points right there. Plus, we'll get one point for the house and two points if it's next to the river, which it is. So now we're up to seven points. And we also get one point for each nearby school. And our gambit paid off. There is a school over here. So overall, this is an eight-point play. We were at 44, so this brings us up to 52. And when we cross around this track, we can take this 50-point token and put it over here to show that we add those points to the amount that we have on the track. Well, it's time for our final tile take of the game. And I think it's this granary. That is worth essentially six points to us. Yeah, let's go for it. Before we actually place this, we're going to use the railway station, and we can use that to move this wood workshop there to make it part of that group. And suddenly, our board's looking pretty good. And then we can put the granary down here, where it's worth three points plus one if it's adjacent to the farm, which it is. So that is four points. And we expanded our commercial group for final scoring. Four points is going to bring us from two up to six. And then we can place these down. And I think we'll put the temple here and this railway station down over there. Well, that finished our final turn of the game. And now green can start their final turn by drawing three new tiles. And now they're going to take the school. They'll place that here. And as you can see, this is a residential tile. And they're putting it on top of their placement bonus, which wants a residential building. So that is going to get them two points for building the school there. Plus, the school gives another point, so they're up to three, and then another two points for each adjacent pandit house. There is one, so that's another two points, which brings this up to a five-point placement. This will bring them from 46 up to 51. And then for their last tile of the game, they're going to go with the T-stall. They can tell that this is pretty great for the brown player, and it's not bad for them either. That has to be placed here since this is their final spot. And then their placement bonus gets them one point for every house they've built. They really struggled to get houses built. They have one of them, so this is plus one point for them. In addition to that, they get a point for the T-stall, so they're up to two. And the T-stall gets them three points for every adjacent cow shed. They do have one here, so that's another three points, which makes this a five-point placement. So they go from 51 up to 56. After that, they can finish their final turn of the game by placing this building down, and they know the brown player really wants a temple. So they're going to cover the temple up with a quarry to force the brown player to place this quarry if they want to actually get that temple down. All right, it's time for brown to take the final turn of the game. 
And after thinking through these options, the brown player has decided this temple is very much worth it. So they're going to take the quarry first, and they'll place that here. That gets them three points, and then they lose two points if it's near the farm, and it is not. So they get three points, bringing them to 46. And then their final tile of the game will be this temple, and they're very happy to get it. They must place it here, and they just covered up their adjacency bonus, which gets them one point for every building near a farm. They have four buildings near a farm, so that is four points. The temple itself is worth three points, and it gets them another point if the temple is in the village center, but it is not. This is not a central green spot. It loses them one point for each nearby industry, and fortunately for them, they don't have any of those. And then they get another two points because this flower stall that is nearby will activate with that temple placement. We haven't really seen this happen in this tutorial so far. I hope I didn't miss any of those in the past. But either way, in this case, they do activate the flower stall getting those two points because the temple is now nearby. So once again, with this placement, they get four plus three, which brings them to seven, plus two, which gets them nine points. This will bring them from 46 up to 55, and our scores are very clustered at this point, going into final scoring. So, Brown's turn is coming to a close, and they don't have to move these tiles down because that was the last turn of the game. As you can see, every single village board is completely full with 16 tiles, and now we can move into final scoring. The first thing we get points for are cowsheds, and specifically, the player or players, if tied, who have the most cowsheds will get 10 points each. The green player got a single cow shed. We were able to pick up two, and the brown player was also able to get two. There are six of these total, so that means the sixth one is somewhere in this pile. I'm sure if that had come out, then the brown player would have definitely placed that on their final turn of the game. So that's a tie for the most with two and two, so we get ten points, and so does brown. This brings us up to 66, and brown up to 65. Now we can score all of the endgame bonus tiles. This is the first one, and it will give 5 points to the player who has the most tea stalls and restaurants, but remember they have to have at least one of each of these. So everyone can figure out their count, and it's 0, 0, 0. The reason for that is because we can see green has a tea stall, but they do not have a restaurant, and over here the brown player has a restaurant, but no tea stall, and we don't have either. Again, you need at least one of each, so the total count is 0, and nobody gets these 5 points. Moving on, this will give 5 points to the player with the most houses and temples. Once again, you have to have at least one of each. Over here, the green player has one house and one temple, so their count is 2. We have 2 houses and a temple, so our count is 3. And over here at the brown player's area, they have 1, 2, 3, 4 houses and that temple that they placed on their very last turn. So their count is 5, which is clearly the majority, so that means brown is going to get these 5 points which will bring them up to 70. Now we can do the next tile, and this gives five points to the player with the most houses and flower stalls. Over here, we can see the green player has a house, but no flower stall. We have a couple of houses, but no flower stalls, and brown has four houses and a flower stall. So their count is five to zero to zero. So brown gets another five points, which brings them up to 75. The final end game scoring tile gives five points to the player with the most pottery and wood workshops. Over here, the green player never got any pottery, so they can't count theirs. We have one, two, three pottery, and one wood workshop. So that's a count of four. And over here, the brown player has one pottery and one wood workshop for a count of two. So our four beats that, and we get these five points, which will bring us up to 71. That's all of the end game scoring tiles, and the final thing that we're going to score up are our largest contiguous groups of each color, again, not counting the general yellow types. Let's begin with ourselves. We can look here and see that we have one cluster of green, one cluster of red, one cluster of blue, and one cluster of purple. So we're going to score every single one of those tiles. Remember, if we had an isolated situation with two independent clusters, then we'd only score the biggest one. Fortunately, we were able to make our board work out this way. So that is going to be essentially 16 minus 5, which is 11 tiles that score. And again, we get two points each. So that's 22 points. We were at 71, so that brings us to our final score of 93. Next up, green can score. They have one green group, two blue groups, one purple group, and one red. So we can see they're not going to score, obviously, these yellows, and they also won't score this blue because it is not connected, and that's a much bigger blue group that they are going to score. So they're going to score two points for all but three of their tiles. That means 13 tile score, which gets them 26 points. That brings them from 56 up to a final score of 82.
Finally, the brown player can score. They have two red groups, so this smaller one won't count, and then one green, one blue, and one purple, and quite a few of these yellows, which again, don't count for this. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of their 16 that won't count. That means nine of these will get them two points each, so that's 18 points. They were at 75, and when you add 18 to that, it ties them with us at 93 points. So the final scores are 93, 82, 93, and we have a tie for first. Now, there is a tiebreaker condition, and that is the player who has the largest single group of one type of scoring tile in their area. Looking at our board, our biggest type is 5 with these industrial. And over here, Brown's biggest area is four with the residential. And that means we win the tiebreaker and we win the game. If there had been a tie here, like if we had our biggest as four and their biggest as four, then there is no other tiebreaker and we would share in the victory. So we just barely won the game. Brown came in second and Green came in third. And that completes a full three-player game of Panchayat. Now, over the course of this tutorial, I do believe I've taught just about all of the rules to the game. So that means this video is going to come to an end. And I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.